All right, uh, thank you, Titus. Uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Haggai chapter 1, verse 1? You hear an echo? Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. Or is it just me? This, my voice seems like it's projecting out. You can hear something? Really? Oh, is it really? And this speaker? Well, those speakers, because I know those sometimes come on notice. Uh, no, it just sounds like it's, maybe I'm just dreaming. Doesn't that sound like it? All right. Well, it doesn't bother, the recording doesn't bother me either. I'm just saying. All right. Hello? I, I, I guess, yeah. I guess. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Sorry about it. I thought I heard, you know. But then again, my ears are all plugged up, so what do I know? All right. Should we ha- uh, go, turn to Haggai chapter 1, verse 1? We're going to uh, wrap up our studies in, uh, in Haggai this week. And uh, just remember, we've been announcing this. Uh, the uh, the next three weeks, our weekday classes, uh, we won't be having weekday classes th- uh, the following three weeks. So that would be uh, Tuesday, May, tw- May 21st, uh, Thursday, May 23rd, Tuesday, May 28th, Thursday, May 30th. And also you got June 4th on a Tuesday and June 6th. Those days, all, all those classes are canceled. There's only one Sunday class that'll be canceled because I'll be out of town. Uh, it'll be uh, Sunday, June 2nd. So mark that in your calendar. And um, uh, what else? Um, I think that's about it for the uh, the announcements. And uh, let's uh, let's take a, a moment. If you could, uh, I would appreciate it if you guys could keep me in prayer. My, I'm, I'm I'm sick again. I don't know what I have. I don't know if it's allergy, combination of allergies or cold. But I really like appreciate the prayers because I'm sick of time being sick. I was just got over something not too long ago. Titus, we had just had something. So if you could keep me in prayer, that would appreciate it. I don't really like, want to go to the doctors again. I don't like the doctor's office. So anyways, anyways, let's uh, take a moment of silent prayer. <clears throat> and we also, we have our uh, friend, uh, Tyler Thompson. He's with us tonight. He's gracing our presence here. Good to have you. <laughs> All right, so let's take a moment of silent prayer. As is our custom, we take this moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves and determine if we need to uh, confess, our, confess our sins to the Father. That restores us to fellowship with God, which we maintain by our obedience to the Spirit who speaks to us to the Scriptures, and that's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. So without further ado, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for another day to study your word. We thank you for everyone here this evening in the Thompson home. We thank you, and also those on the internet that might be viewing this class live or related date through the recordings on the website or YouTube, wherever these lessons are found. We thank you for Titus and Jody's hospitality. We thank you for Titus's uh, work with the sound and the recordings. We thank you for his service, the technology, and the people taking advantage of it. And we just thank you for everyone in the audience that you would, and we also pray that you would help them by the power of the Spirit. Uh, to uh, understand what's going to be taught here this evening in Haggai 1.6. Help them to concentrate and, and be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction. We pray that each person will be spoken to in their particular set of circumstances and their walk with you. And all of us as a corporate unit would get uh, the message of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would help me uh, to uh, speak here this evening uh, clearly and with accuracy and clarity, reverence and respect for your word. Help me to bring forth your full counsel with uh, in a fashion that would be pleasing to you. Help me to be your instrument by the power of the Spirit so that your people could receive their necessary spiritual nourishment. So, Father, we pray for this service in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're going to be studying Haggai chapter 1, verse 6 here this evening. In this passage, we'll see that the Lord disciplined the remnant of Judah for failing to complete the rebuilding of his temple. That's what this book is all about. In fact, um, you know, the... Uh, uh, what's interesting about this particular t- uh, situation here that we're reading about in the, in the book of Haggai is that it leads to, remember, the, it's actually a pre- 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 preparation. This rebuilding of the temple is actually a preparation for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, to enter into the temple because that would fulfill prophecy as well. So this temple that they're going to rebuild, it actually we call it Zerubbabel's temple. It became Herod's temple because Herod uh, expanded upon it and made it more magnificent uh, than Zerubbabel's temple and uh, he renovated it and that's the temple that Jesus Christ walked into and, and taught 
And uh, so uh, this is actually all preparation for the Messiah to come. And uh, remember, we, we, we pointed out that uh, in, historically, uh, in, the, in, in where we are with the book of Haggai in relation to what's gone on in the Old Testament and uh, prior to what goes on later after it, um, we see that uh, we have to go back all the way to, uh, remember, with uh, Moses. And, you know, the nation of Israel started there when the God called them out of Egypt. You know, when you did Joshua, uh, excuse me, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob had his 12 sons, and they became the nation of Israel. They moved to Egypt and during the days of Josh, Joshua, uh, Joseph. And then uh, we see that uh, once Moses died, then Joshua brought them into the promised land, and then they fought, fell away from God, and those were the period of the judges. And then we come around to First, Second Samuel, and you got uh, uh, Samuel, the prophet Samuel, and then David follows him. And King David, and, and he had his son Solomon, that was the United Monarchy, we call it, and uh, the United Kingdom. So then what happened is they die off, and then we see the, that uh, the Northern Kingdom, uh, we have, uh, oh, actually back it up a bit, Solomon, remember, Solomon, because of his uh, inf- unfaithfulness to God, toward the end of his life where he loved uh, many foreign women who led him astray, and he actually committed idolatry, amazingly enough, the man who wrote scripture, right? And he uh, was, uh, God was very unhappy with him and he, was gonna te- he wasn't going to tear the kingdom away from King Solomon, though he would have, he, he could, it was justified to do so. But he said to Solomon, to, to the prophet, he said, I won't take the kingdom away from you because of your father, David, but I will take it away from your son. And Rehoboam was the one who had the kingdom ripped away from him. After his father's death, he took over and he listened to his he listened to his uh, uh, younger advisors rather than the older advisors. The younger advisors were saying, tax the people even more, more than your father did, Solomon. And the older guys were saying, don't. They, the people need a break from the taxes that your, your father with his building projects for his wives and homes and all that stuff and spending all money on his foreign wives. You know, you need to dump the, knock the tax thing down. But they didn't listen to the, they, he didn't listen to the older guys. And so he listened to the newer guys. And then that caused the rebellion. Ten of the tribes, we call them the Northern Kingdom. And if you look at First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you have the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah. The kings of Israel were those, uh, the leaders of the uh, the kings of the the, tw- uh, the, tw- the ten tribes, which we call the Northern Kingdom. The, the kings of Judah were the kings uh, king over uh, the Southern Kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, which was composed of Judah, and the other tribe was Benjamin. So. They, they, what happened is they were involved in idolatry, the northern kingdom, and then those uh, God brought in a nation, an evil, wicked nation, Assyria, to uh, basically discipline them. As He used Assyria as his instrument to discipline the northern kingdom. And so they were sent into captivity. They never did return, uh, even though God had actually implored them to come back, those who were still alive, but they never did. And they never come back as a national, national entity. And then you got in five, six, oh, five, the southern kingdom, kingdom of Judah, they fell into idolatry, and they were unrepentant about it. And and then you had uh, in 605, 597, and 586 BC, you have God using another wicked nation, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, to discipline the, the southern kingdom. And they were sent into, they were deported. The temple was destroyed. And they no, were, no longer were a national entity for 70 years, according to Jeremiah's prophecy. And then God brings them back in. He brings them back into the, uh, into the land. And you have Haggai. And, you know, Haggai is, is a... The, as a part of the first wave of people that came in, you have Haggai. There was uh, Je- Zechariah, who was uh, actually uh, a contemporary of Haggai, who's doing the same thing that Haggai was do- doing, but it had a, uh, his work was much bigger um, as far as prophecy was concerned. And then you have uh, Ezra. Ezra was a great scribe, and he was calling the people back to repentance. And then you have Nehemiah, uh, who was, uh, he completed the, the, the wall of the city of Jerusalem. So Haggai, his job with Zechariah was to get the people to finish the temple. Ezra talks about the temple being uh, rebuilt. They started it, but then the enemies of Judah uh, intimidated uh, them, and then they actually went over to the Persian Empire, uh, Persian monarch, who was uh, out of Xerxes, and they got him to decree that the, the temple work must stop. Even though Cyrus, uh, who actually said it was to happen, and we were to help, uh, people were to help them rebuild the Lord's temple. And so Artaxerxes, finally he goes, he dies, and then you have Darius, Histaspus, the Darius we hear, read about here in Haggai. And he 
goes and at the prompting of the Jewish leaders, like Zerubbabel, uh, he said, they said, go check the archives and you'll see that Cyrus has decreed that this temple should be rebuilt. And, and they did. They went in the archives, the Persian monarch, uh, monarchy, and they found that is exactly the case. So Darius said, okay, we're going to start this temple project up again. Let's go. Let's do it. And so that's where we are with the book of Haggai. And Haggai, you know, he's... Uh, He's calling these people back to uh, obedience to God, and in particular, the, the command that he's looking uh, to, to, to get, wanting them to uh, obey here. Uh, he mentions nothing about obedience to the law, but he does mention obeying the command to get this temple rebuilt. And so it was in, uh, it was started uh, uh, in, and it was broken off the work. And so it was actually in a state of disrepair. And so Haggai said, let's finish the work, not start the building, because the building had already started of the, of the temple back in, uh, they, the foundation was established, as you read Ezra 3, 4, and 5, the foundation of the temple was established. We'll talk about this later in the book of Haggai, because it alludes to that in chapter 2. So it's in a state of disrepair. It's not completed yet. So he says, get completed. Well, well the people had not uh, they had basically, because of the time elapsed, they took that building material that was uh, earmarked by Cyrus for the building of the temple, and because the work was broken off because of Artaxerxes decree, then you had the people taking the paneling that was sp- the wood that was supposed to be the t- wood from Lebanon that was supposed to be for the temple and using it on their own homes, as we pointed out, and so they were putting their their uh, their priority of their their own homes and their own comfort ahead of the rebuilding that temple it told you it was a manifestation of their fact that their priorities were wrong and then we pointed out there's a very 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 important thing for the church age believe it or hear about today in the 21st century especially in america where the church in america in general not everybody when i say the church in america i'm saying in general terms it is true the people in christianity in america don't have their priorities straight. We're very wealthy, especially in America. We're very wealthy. We're very, uh, we're, we're so used to comfort. We've never suffered persecution. Our nation started on uh, by, by men who had strong uh, respect for the Bible and Judeo-Christian ethic and our constitution and reflects that. And so we started off that way. But as the time has rolled by and people come in from other nations, especially in the last 50, 60 years, 100 years, uh, and then you have the postmodern era, of this world where they the country is going away from that and people coming from different, uh, uh, you know, is people from Islam and, they, you know, there's uh, atheism is uh, pro- proliferated and you have people from different religions and they're coming into our country and they're not Christians and they're not Jewish and they don't understand the Judeo-Christian ethic, ethic or, they're, or they're antagonistic to it. So Americans have never really had to suffer for their faith like most people around the world have done for centuries in the Christian church. And even today, as we speak in Russia and China and India and Pakistan, Christians in Africa, people are suffering for being Christians. Americans have never had that. So Americans, we have very wealthy, and that's why our first John study is huge because you know we studied that passage about do not love the things of the world. And so that passage that we saw in First John 2, 15 through 17 is very important because it's talking about, you know, uh, we, you know it's very, in America, the possessions, the goods, the, you know, the lifestyle, all that uh, in the, is all basically driven by Satan to get you to go and not put God first in your list of priorities. And that's what the church, it's the same thing. We, got, we can tie that section of John, 1 John, with Haggai, and the Christian church got a big, pretty big message. Put God first, otherwise you will be disciplined. And God is doing that to the, he did that to the remnant of Judah. And, he, and once they obeyed him, the discipline was lifted. So, uh, you know, we be very careful in America because, you know, the great, you know, I think in a lot of ways, American Christians, the people who are faithful in American Christianity, okay, because of the great pressure, you know, of the, you know, the, the attractiveness, the seduction of wealth that we have, and trust me, we're very wealthy uh, compared to the rest of the world. I've, I've, I've had people, I've had an email from a guy in Pakistan or India, and these guys have nothing. I mean, and, and so... Compared to the rest of the world, we're really wealthy, even the poorest among us in this country. 
and uh, who live in, a, you know, people who, you know, live in low-income housing, they're, they're just, they got it much better than most people in the world. And if you've ever been overseas, you'll, you can see that for yourself. So you have, you know, the seduction of the money and the entertainment and the good, li- you know, the lifestyle thing, you know. It's in television and media and is you know, there's in community, uh, internet, there's so many things that take you away and distract you from the pastor on down in the church. And so that's why if you remain faithful in this, in this culture, you know, with, especially with sex is thrown in your face, like they never had this problem in the first century. They had problems with sex and temple prostitutes and all that stuff. But you know, with a click of a mouse, I mean, you, you, you're, you, you're into world of pornography. If you, if you just like that, it's, everywhere sex is pushed in your face on television and the temptations especially young christians want to honor god they have tremendous pressure you have to keep an eye on them for that and help them in it in any way you can because it's a really big pressure and so you put all that together and if you can overcome be an overcomer in this culture in america you're doing pretty good it's kind of like with daniel and babylon and his friends you know that we're not alone i mean christians in america have got you know, are, are no different than other Christians in a, in a certain sense because, you know, they, other, other believers have lived, like Daniel lived in a pagan culture. And uh, so, you know, we need to uh, keep our priorities straight and you know, learn the message of uh, Haggai, keep our priorities straight, and we will avoid being disciplined by God. D- discipline is a mark of a, ch- being disciplined by God is a mark of being a child of God. God doesn't discipline the devil's kids. He disciplines us, I'll tell you. I'll tell you something that many unbelievers that you might say to yourself: Why do unbelievers always seem everything goes well for them? They got money. They go, nothing seems to go bad for them. Well, they're having their God's given them, you know, everything their heart desires now. But when they die, it's all over with. Now the, the chickens come home to roost, and they're going to have to go and suffer the consequences for rejecting Him. And so God, in his grace, you know, blessed them, you know, way over. And then you see some people like Lazarus who suffered their whole lives and honored God, yet they were, they were considered the off-scouring of the earth. Well, things are the first of la- the la- first are last and the last are first now. So, you know, yeah, the unbeliever might look like he's doing well now, and you might say, oh, I wish I was like them. No, well, you don't want to, because one day they're going to die, and then they're going to have to face the consequences. So you, want, you too and me are going to die someday, unless the rapture comes, and we're going to have to bear the consequences of our decisions in life. And here's the number one priority, obey God. It, you read the end of Ecclesiastes, says the same thing. I mentioned this last this past Tuesday. You know, at the end of the matter, Solomon tried all kinds of things. Uh, you know, the experiment, sex, women, uh, power, uh, entertainment. He tried everything, all those tests he tried. At the end of the day, all is vanity. At the end of the day, all that really matters is, are you obeying God? And so Haggai is basically telling these people, come back to obeying God and the temple is the starting point for this all to take place. So look at Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. We'll read the first 11 verses, which is basically Haggai's message uh, to the, the remnant of Judah. So look at Haggai 1, 1, please. On the first day of the sixth month, a king derives his second year. The Lord spoke this message to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Governor of Judah, and to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak. The Lord who rules over all says this. These people have said the time for rebuilding the Lord's temple, <clears throat> excuse me, has not come, has not yet come. So the Lord spoke to the prophet Haggai as follows. Is it right for you to live in richly paneled houses while my temple is in ruins? Here then is what the Lord who rules over all says. Think carefully about what you're doing. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but are never filled. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but are not warm. Those who earn wages end up with holes in their money bags. Moreover, the Lord who rules over all says, pay close attention to these things also. Go up to the hill country and bring back timber to build a temple. Then I will be pleased and honored, says the Lord. You expected a a large harvest, but instead there was little. And when you brought it home, it disappeared right away. Why, asked the Lord of rules over all, because my temple is in ruins, remains in ruins, thanks to each of you favoring his own house. This is why the sky has held back its dew 
and the earth its produce. Moreover, I have called for a drought that will affect the fields, the hill country, the grain, new wine, fresh olive oil, and everything that grows on the ground. It will also harm people, animals, and everything they produce. Verses 12 to 15 gives the response, which was of obedience. But you notice something there in the passage? As you're reading, you talk about, and you see in uh, verses uh, 3, uh, verses 5, 6, and 7, you, uh, and then uh, you have uh, God basically telling them this, you, you, things are going badly for you, okay? You, get, you, uh, you're, you have economic and uh, agricultural hardship. Then verse 8, he gives the command, okay, to rebuild the temple. Then you look at verses 9, and then you look at verses 9, 10, and 11. There you go, he goes right back into talking about why, that they're being disciplined and they, they're having hardship. Well, the reason why that is because the verses... 4 through 11 are set up in a, actually 4 through 9, are set up in a, in a, in a uh, chiastic structure, which is inver, in, uh, inverted parallelism. So uh, we get, you know, it's, you know, the uh, A, B, B, A, okay? And then in the middle, what I, mean, what I mean by that is some verses parallel each other, okay? Uh, and then there's one verse that doesn't. That's verse 8. That verse that doesn't parallel any others in the section is actually the message of of Haggai in this section of Haggai, which is go build the temple. So it's set up that way. It's very important because, you know, you, you read things, you know, First uh, John was set up in a chiastic structure. This is common in the Bible. You see Philemon, the whole book, that whole letter was set up in a chiastic structure. So it's very interesting. And the reason why they did that was for memorization, but uh, because they were ba- basically an audio uh, uh, people. We are very visual. We don't, we don't, we're not like the people in the ancient world at all. Uh, we're video, we're eye, we, everything's vi- uh, with, uh, with our eyes. They were, they listened better than we do. We're not as good listeners as the ancient people were. Because, and they were not, and they were much, they were, even people who were, couldn't write or read, but they could listen and they could remember. And the teacher would, even Jesus did this, the way he taught, like the rabbis, he would do things that were very memorable and set up his messages that you could remember those things. And that's why a lot of the apostles could remember things, you know, 30 years later, because the gift of the Holy Spirit, but also the way Jesus taught, okay, which was very memorable things, the way he did things. Now, we see, we're going to look at uh, verse 6 here this evening, Haggai 1.6. Now, as we noted, and as we just read, in our study of Haggai 1.5, the Lord, through the prophet Haggai, issues a command in this verse, which is directed at Zerubbabel, the governor of the remnant of Judah, and Joshua the high priest, and ultimately the remnant of Judah. Now this command, as we pointed out Tuesday, is actually an inference from the rhetorical question that we read in verse 4, which was posed by the Lord through Haggai to Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest, and ultimately the remnant of Judah. Now this rhetorical question demanded an emphatic negative answer. And it asks, is it time for each one of you, yes, each and every one of you, to live in your richly paneled homes, while on the other hand, this temple is in a state of disrepair. That's my translation, as I pointed out. It brings out, it's more literal, and it brings out the more emphatic nature of this rhetorical question. Now, why is it, why is this rhetorical question, uh, why does he use a rhetorical question? Well, he did it because he wanted to get, it was more powerful. He got them, instead of giving them a declarative statement, he gives them a rhetorical question to cause them to think about themselves and, their, and examine themselves. That's why he, that's Paul uses rhetorical questions quite a bit. Jesus used rhetorical questions. And rhetorical questions can be, you can ask a rhetorical, we saw that in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. You can make a, give a rhetorical question and it's very impactful. It's very powerful. The person's getting the question knows exactly what the answer is, but the pa- fact that the person who's talking to them gives a, the teacher is giving the declar- uh, a rhetorical question rather than declarative statement, it, 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 it makes me think, okay? It's making me think about my priorities, and that's exactly what God was doing through Haggai. I want this remnant to think about their priorities. Now, the command in verse 5, as we pointed out and just read, requires that each and every one of the citizens of the remnant of Judah examine carefully their hearts with regards to their ways. Uh, now, what you see in the Net Bible, uh, they, they translate it, uh, we, we pointed this out, they don't use the word hearts there, though they got the sense of the passage right. If you look at verse 5, here then is what the Lord of rules over says, 
uh, think carefully about what you're doing. In the Greek, it literally means examine carefully your hearts. And the heart in the Bible is not your cardiovascular system. It's where you do your thinking. It's where our subconscious is, the, the garbage can for the, the mind, things that shock and, 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 and scare us. We put there. Sometimes they come out in dreams. Uh, your mentality, your frame of reference, uh, your conscience, where your norms and standards are, your volition, where you make your decisions. All of these things are what the Bible calls, are found in what the Bible calls the heart. And the obvious implication of this statement here in verse 5 is that the remnant of Judah was totally and completely wrong to not complete the rebuilding of the Lord's temple when they themselves lived in richly paneled homes. In other words, this statement is designed to get them to reconsider their attitude toward the rebuilding of this temple and thus their priorities. So one of the things that scripture does, and you see it here in the church age, and you see over the years, those who've listened to me, well, it doesn't matter what the study is, the Holy Spirit will be saying things. He's always uh, trying to get you to think about your, what's your attitude. Everything about in life is attitude and perspective. Really is the secret. You, the, you got to have an attitude that's based upon what the word of God has to say, not what the world has to say in your circumstances. And Attitude is everything in perspective, putting things in perspective. I, I, uh, it will help you look at yourself more objectively. Like I, there's a picture. Somebody had a picture on Facebook. I don't know who it was. Oh, I was looking through some things. You know, people you may know, you know, on Facebook, they have that. So I just, I never look at that. So I, tonight I was before class just doing that. And uh, I looked at it and there's this person. I don't know. I can't remember their name. doesn't matter. But they had a picture for their Facebook thing. And it was a woman Having a holding a, a bottle of water like this to a little African child who was had been was hungry. I mean, there was just there was nothing left of the kid. You know, the kid was a little. You know, and he was just drinking some of the water there. And then you know, it, the, the the caption was, "You don't your life is not so bad." <laughs> it's true. Our lives are not so bad when we think about it. I mean, I was just thinking about somebody. There's a there's a guy. Um, he's a great Bible scholar. And um, I can't remember, his, I can't pronounce his last name. I got, I, I, his name's Ed. And he's a, a friend of Dan Wallace. He's wrote a book, uh, you know, book when Dan's trying to raise money for this poor guy who's got tremendous health issues. Like he was, supposed, he didn't, he couldn't go to the doctor because he just didn't have the money to go to the doctor. And he's had a tremendous debt. So he's trying to raise, they're trying to raise money for him. And I think about this poor guy, you know, he's like, he's, he, he doesn't have his health. I just got my doctors, well, I'm doing great my health wise. This poor guy, you know, he's a great Bible scholar and he's like just a wreck, you know, physical, he, he had tremendous physical problems. I don't have it so bad when I think about him. And that's, again, an example of perspective. You know, we think we, we, think we, uh, we have it bad, but really if we compare ourselves, something, that's a good thing to compare yourself. The people who, don't, who have it rough, rougher than you, then it makes you say, well, I don't feel so bad, you know, <laughs> I don't feel so bad. In fact, that's how I look at Paul. You know, anytime, you know, things get tough, I'll read 2 Corinthians. And Paul, it's like, what am I complaining about? What am I feeling worried about? What do I, I mean, I don't have it so bad. This guy is like gone through, I mean, he's getting, you know, 39 lashes from the Jews. And, you know, and he's gotten uh, beaten, persecuted, everything. We've talked about his persecution. I right, goodness gracious, I've never been, you know, I mean, I've looked, been spoken to, you know, uh, unkindly and, you know, I had the, you know, da daggers looked at me and stuff, you know, but I never had anybody take a shot and punch me in the face or anything or whip me 39 times like they did to Paul. I don't got out that bad. I mean, these guys and pastors are getting killed, getting shot at all the time. I know in Africa and Pakistan and, you know, okay, so I've never been shot at yet. <laughs> so what am I worried about? You know, it could be a lot worse. So perspective is everything. So God when he uses this rhetorical question in these, in these statements here, he's basically trying to get the remnant of Judah to start thinking. And thinking is a very important part of spirituality. In fact, it's everything. It's everything. We have to use our brain and think. We can't be lazy people in our thinking. And that's the undoing of many Christians. They, they, they don't want to think biblically. It takes, sometimes it takes hard work to be a Christian and to think things through. And, and, it's, and, you know, if you struggle with things, that's a good sign because it shows that you're thinking about things and asking questions. I they struggle and think things. I was just thinking of stuff, some stuff the other day, trying to reconcile it with what the Word of God says in my own life. It's like, you know, you, 
you have sometimes you have to go and struggle sometimes. But those who diligently seek me shall find me, Jesus said. But so that means there's a little work he puts behind it. And that's because of develop our faith. Now, when the Lord commands this remnant to examine carefully their hearts with regards to their ways, as the Net Bible says, uh, he says um, in verse 5, he says, think carefully about what you're doing. He, he, that statement, he's actually emphasizing the manner in which they live their lives and specifically their decision making. Okay? So, ask yourself a question. What is my decision making like? What, when I make decisions, what am I bringing into consideration? Am I bringing into consideration God? Uh, uh, I mean, what, what, what kind of decisions am I making? Is, is the decision you've been the decisions you've been making is it something that God would be pleased with, or is it decisions that are basically for you and all thinking about just you and you alone and not the Lord or the body of Christ? You know, that's the kind of questions you get to ask yourself. How am I living my life? If somebody, if you were to die today, and they, you, you know, you're in the coffin, they said, well, that person, what, are they, what were they all about? Would they be able to say to you and look you in the, you know, I wouldn't want to be in a coffin. I don't want to, I'd, I'd rather have a closed casket. Why don't anybody want to look at me? I want to have a picture of me when I was alive. But when you're in the, you just say, that guy, he, he, you know, I know what that guy or that woman was all about. It was about Jesus. It was about the word of God, the Bible. They were always, you know, they're going to, you know, that, I know what their lives were. I know what they, they were, they were about. Some people, you, who are Christians, you never know they were about Jesus or about the, about the word of God, Jesus. They just, you just don't know them any different from, you can't distinguish them from the people of the world. So at the end of the day, what are you going to be remembered for? Somebody who cared about the Lord and his thing, or his, his, what he felt important. You made your decisions, you had your, your priorities were centered upon your Christianity, your, your, your Lord and Savior, the body of Christ, you know, and that's something we have to ask ourselves in the decisions, you know, uh, that we make in life. Are we doing this? And here, we always have to do this. We've never arrived until we've died or the rapture, whichever comes first. So it's very easy, even with pastors, we're no different than anybody else. You could slip away from your true love. You know, you could be slip, slip away very easily and not realize you're falling away. So it's very easy, very uh, important that we examine our lives, our decisions we're making in life, and, wh- how, and, and you know, when we, if we make mistakes and we've sinned, confess it and learn the lesson. You know, sometimes we learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. I'll tell you right now, I think we always learn more from our failures than our successes, quite frankly, because we're humbled. And that's something very important. So you can either make a decision and get you know, and say, no, I, I'm not going to learn from my, 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 I didn't do that. Um, you know, it's somebody else's fault. Or you can say, yeah, I did do that. I failed. I want to get better. And I want to learn from that. And that's everything. Everybody falls down. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody does. Everybody sins. It's who gets up. At the end of the day, it's now well done, good and fa- perfect servant. It's well done, good and faithful servant. So it, the past, learn from the past. You know, learn, uh, go back and look at the past to, for motivation. You know, God, this is what God did for me in the past. I'm going to use that as motivation uh, to do his will uh, and, 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 and do that. Decision making is very important. So when the Lord, again, commands this remnant to examine carefully their hearts with regards to their ways, he's emphasizing the manner in which they live their lives and specifically the decision making. So the implication is that they must examine their priorities. In other words, the reason why this remnant never completed the rebuilding of the Lord's temple was because of wrong priorities, meaning that with them, doing the Lord's will did not take precedent over what they wanted in life. Or we could say what they wanted came first in their priorities, followed by what the Lord wanted. He got second place, okay? And that God does not like. We're his children, and he wants his children to put his will first. If not, he will teach us the hard way. He will put us and discipline us so that we learn the lesson. Just like a parent, a mother and a father in the natural realm will discipline their little girl and little boy that no, 
You're not going to do this. You're not going to. You're not going to punch your sister in the face. No, you're not going to go and scream and yell around the house. Uh, no, you're not going to leave your, bed, your bedroom a mess. No, you, you're going to be not a self-centered per, self-centered person. I'm going to teach you, and if you don't listen to what I say and obey me, then I'm going to have to discipline you and spank you. And as you get, you're going to keep doing it. I will. I'll take away. As you got to be a teenager, I'll take away the things that you find very important television, the computer, because I'm trying to train you. I don't, I'm, it's the hardest job in the world is to do that. And to, they want to indoctrinate their kids, get their kids to have character. And that's what God does. That's what God does. There's a certain way God wants us to act and we don't act the way he, he, want us, we, he wants us to act when we put our own things ahead of what he wants. Remember Paul in his writings, he says, slaves of Christ Jesus. I don't like when they put servants of Christ Jesus in the translation. It means slave, the word doulos. And the ancient world, I've said this in the past, people in the first century knew exactly what Paul was saying. When he says, I was a slave of Christ Jesus, and Timothy is as well. A slave in the Roman Empire, slavery was an institution. And everybody knew a slave. He did what his master wanted, not what he did, wanted to do. He wasn't going to go to the mall, shopping mall, go shopping for himself. No, he was going to go and do whatever the, his master told him to do. His life was controlled by his master's will. So that's the way our lives should be. Every decision we make, every thought, we should be brought into obedience to Christ. Every, when, when, we, when we choose a job, do we, are we choosing it thinking about God? How is this going to affect my relationship with God? I mean, if you're working 90 hours a week and you don't have time for God, that's a problem. You make something wrong here. You know, no, that's not a good place to be. You need to make a change. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, sports, entertainment. You, you find it's more important to, uh, you know, watch Dancing with the Stars. Is that show even, even on anymore? And you watch the Dance with the Stars. Is that more important in your life than going to Bible class? I mean, what is important to you? And if, you know, this is where, you know, I find that a lot of people I've, over the years as a pastor, I've had people come in, you know, I, rem- I had this one, per- actually a several person over, uh, over the years, you know, they were saying, I remember you telling us the things I'm talking about. And they were saying, and I didn't, I was gone, I went off and they were basically, I was, bo- I was in backslide and bo- apostasy and I got disciplined. And I realize now, that what was going on was discipline. God was disciplining me, you know, and some of them learned the lesson. Some of them never, don't learn the lesson. They keep going back into apostasy. They, and they start, they were all right for a little while, but then they drift off into apostasy. And that's a terrible place to be. That's, a, that's misery. You know, it's nothing worse. I mean, when God, you know, what God's trying to do is trying to, he's trying to lead us to joy and happiness. That's where we learn is, is, is doing as well. That's the only place you're going to find joy and happiness. This world can give you things, and, but they're not, they're all transitory. They're passing away. What did we learn in 1 John 2, 17? Those who do the will of God, that lasts forever. The people who love the things of the world, they're going, to be, they're going to lose all these things in the end because they're all going to be wiped off the face of the earth with the tribulation period and the second advent of Christ. So, you know, the sports, the entertainment, you know, the, the, the trips to Hawaii, you know, the RVs, the dogs, the cats, the animals, the, the homes, the, the big lawns, and all that stuff is all gone. It's all gone. Kiss goodbye. Yeah, it's all right. Use it to do God's will. Use these things as an instrument. Don't fall in love with these things because they're going to be taken away from you or you're going to be taken away from them. And that's very important that we learn in that in life. That's what the remnant of Judah needed to learn as well. So these verses that we're reading about in, in verses uh, 4 and 5 of Haggai 1 make clear that the reason why the rebuilding of the Lord's temple was not completed was not because of the enemies of the remnant of Judah or any nation, but rather it was because they did not have their priorities right. They make excuses. They made excuses. There's no excuse for what they were doing. They were screwing up. They were doing their own thing. Who's kidding who? So they don't, you can't make, there's another thing. You can't make excuses with God. I mean, you can but you're not fooling him. And he will deal you with you when you make excuses. And people make excuses all the time. And they, your pastor's here because they're the person who's supposed to represent God. 
they're the leader in the church, they're the leaders in the church, and they hear it all the time, and they just sit there and they go, oh, another excuse why they can't come to Bible class. They make kids an excuse, jobs excuse, money excuse, everything under the sun, even health. I know people who used to go to Bible class six times a week, and they were suffered, they were disability, uh, de- debilitating, uh, what do they call it, diabetes, the worst you got, okay? And they would still go to Bible class. I remember that, you know, my, you know, I couldn't even get in the other place. I couldn't even get my deacons to go during the weekday classes. And I had one deacon who had t- tremendous suffering with his d- diabetes, and he was there every night. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, he was there at the prayer meetings, everything. And there was the other guy who had, the, you know, with Wayne with his heart problems and everything. He was there all the time. And I couldn't even get my own, you know, people who were supposed to be my leaders in the, our church. Couldn't even get them to go during one weekday class. It was a pitiful and I've seen that in other churches. I know pastors have the same problem. You know, the big shots, they think they're big shots, but they're not really big shots because God looks at them as like, you fools, what a waste of your lives. You have a great opportunity here to be a part of a ministry that I'm using and get the gospel out. And what are you doing with it? You're throwing it all away for what? And you're making excuses why you can't do it. You know, didn't Jesus have that parable? Was it, it was in Luke, you know, and he was inviting them all. It was actually, it's actually a... a He's talking to the Jews who rejected him as savior. He gave him the parable. You know, he got, you know, he invited them and then they were, rege- they were blowing off the invitation. That was represented the Jewish uh, people uh, in Jesus day. And then he'd go out and go to the Gentiles and invite people to the wedding feast. And, but people made excuses. I, I, I have a, I've married a wife and I can't come. And, you know, and that's a, but the, the, the point is, did God get a, did, the parable, did God accept their excuses? No. He didn't, and he was angry for their excuses. And this is going to be ha- this is true right now. That's why God disciplines his people. Now, here in Haggai one six, look at verse six. Now, important that we know these previous verses because I need to re- reiterate some of these things. I wanted to bring some more things out in those, uh, especially verse five that I couldn't get in the other night. But before we look at verse six, we need to look at some things in verses four and five. Otherwise, verse six is incomprehensible. So Haggai 1, six, it says, you have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but are never filled. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but are not warm. Those who earn wages end up with holes in their money bag. So here in verse six, the Lord through the prophet Haggai is solemnly presenting the consequences of the remnant of Judah not making the completion of the rebuilding of the Lord's temple the number one priority in their lives. This verse contains five statements, as we can see. All of them are directed at the remnant of Judah, the kingdom of Judah. The first states, as we just read, that the remnant of Judah sowed in abundance but harvested a small number of crops. The second states that they had eaten but were never satiated, meaning satisfied. Their hunger was never satisfied. Third, the uh, third statement states that they drank, but their thirst was never satisfied. The, these first three assertions reveal that what the remnant of Judah harvested barely met their needs. The fourth statement in the verse states that they put on clothes, but were never worn by doing so. And this assertion reveals that the clothing worn by the remnant of Judah was very thin as a result of having little fiber from which to make their clothing. And the fifth and final statement says that when they earned wages, they earned wages for a money bag pierced with holes. So this assertion reveals that the money that this remnant earned was quickly gone or spent to pay their bills. Now, it's quite interesting. <laughs> um, see, uh, the, um, if you notice, he mentions money there. At the very end, he says, those who earn wages end up with holes in their money bags. Uh, commenting on this passage, Thomas Constable, who you can download his stuff free of charge, he's a great Bible teacher. Uh, he does stuff like, you can get it all his, he does the whole, the whole Bible. You know, it's not in exhaustive detail, but he's really good trans. I use him all the time, his commentaries. And you can download them, Sonic Light, I think it's called, and off the internet, every, uh, every um, book in the Bible. You know, I strongly, strongly recommend that. If you look, uh, someday, I'm, if I have the time, I'd like to do that myself, just do the whole Bible and do that, but I have other things I'm doing right now. But Thomas Constable writes, this passage may be the first reference to coined money in the Bible. It is the first reference to a purse used for carrying money. The Lydians in Asia Minor were the first to coin money in the 6th century BC, and there is archaeological evidence that there were coins in Palestine when Haggai wrote 
end of quote. So we have the first reference really to money there in the Bible. Quite interesting. Now, as we noted in our study of Haggai chapter 1 verses 4 and 5, and also I noticed it, noted it this evening, Haggai uh, chapter 1 verses 4 through 9 is set up in a chiastic structure, inverted parallel, parallelism. One verse parallels another. I brought that out a couple of weeks ago. Haggai 1.6, because of this chiastic structure, Haggai 1.6 is paralleled or corresponds to Haggai 1.9 because of the chiastic structure of, the, of these verses. Uh, look at verse 9. Haggai 1.9. It says, you expected a large harvest, but instead there was little. And when you brought it home, it disappeared right away. Why, asked the Lord of rules over all? Because my temple remains in ruins, thanks to each of you favoring his own house. But the beginning, the first half of the verse, which we just read, uh, you expected a large harvest, but instead there was little. And when you brought it home, it disappeared right away. That parallels Haggai 1.6. As we see, Haggai 1.6 says what? You planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but are never filled. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but are not warm. Those who earn wages end up with holes in their money bags. So the, those verses parallel each other. Now, these five statements that we see in Haggai 1.6 would make clear to the remnant of Judah that the Lord was disciplining them for failing to make the completion of the rebuilding of his temple the number one priority in their lives, as we pointed out. So therefore, by asserting that they sowed an abundance of seed, but harvested little, the Lord is making clear to them that this is the result of his discipline for refusing to complete the rebuilding of his temple. And correspondingly, when he asserts that they had, been, they had eaten but were never satiated, and that they had drank but their thirst was not quenched, and they had put on clothes but were never warm by doing so, this was all the result of his discipline. And lastly, when the Lord asserts that when they earned wages, they earned wages for a money a bag pierced with holes, this again was the result of his discipline. And this is clearly indicated by verses 10 and 11 of Haggai chapter 1. Uh, look at, uh, look at uh, Haggai chapter 1 verse 7. Moreover, the Lord who rules over all says, pay close attention to these things. Go up to the hill country and bring back timber to build a temple. Then I will be pleased and honored, says the Lord. You expected a large harvest, but instead there was little. And when you brought it home, it disappeared right away. Why? Ask the Lord who rules over all. Because my temple remains in ruins, thanks to each of you favoring his own house. This is why the sky has held back its dew and the earth its produce. Moreover, I have called for a drought that will affect the fields. The hill, he will do it. The hill country, the grain, the new wine, fresh olive oil, and everything that grows on the ground, it will also harm people, animals, and everything that they produce. So verses 10 and 11 make clear as well. It drives home the point. You're being disciplined by me because of your bad priorities. And this discipline is very important. And I touched upon this in previous classes earlier in the chapter. This is all based upon the Mosaic law. Remember, Moses set forth principles. He said... God had Moses put down the Mosaic law. If you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will discipline you. That's found in the law, many places, several places in the law. I'm going to take you to them. So when the prophets of Israel that followed Moses, uh, like Haggai uh, or Jeremiah or uh, Isaiah, they were covenant in forces, meaning they were calling the people of Israel back to obeying the law. So Haggai, when he references God's discipline here, you know, we, as we just read in verses 9 through 11 and, you know, verses uh, 5 and 6, he's talking about discipline. All that would be familiar to the people of the remnant of Judah who heard this message from Haggai because they were taught this in their law. They heard it every time uh, in the, uh, when they met and read the Old Testament. They knew this. So they would get the t put two and two together because they, they're referenced to the law. They understood the law. Their frame of reference we're being disciplined by God. God's coming out right now and saying, I'm disciplining you. So this discipline is based upon the warnings found in Leviticus chapter 26, 18 through 20. Deuteronomy 11, 17. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. As well as Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 38 through 40. All of these passages taught Israel that the Lord would discipline them for unrepentant disobedience to his commands and prohibitions. Don't miss this. I say unrepentant disobedience to his commands and prohibitions. That's a key word, unrepentant. Because we sin all the time, don't we? We sin in many ways. The important thing is, do you confess them? Because if you confess them, you're, you're preventing yourself from getting disciplined by God. 
If you don't and refuse to confess the sins for whatever the reasons are, denying that you sin or whatever it is, if you, didn't, if, you, if you refuse to do that, God will discipline you because he wants you to confess the sin so he can have fellowship with you again. Okay, so he continue to form the character of Christ in your life. That's your, the plan he has for you and me. So uh, he, he will discipline us if we don't confess the sin. And, you know, uh, there's positive discipline, there's negative discipline. For instance, uh, 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 Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, a thorn in the flesh was given to him. Now, he was positive to God's word, but he had such great revelation given to him that to keep him humble, God sent a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a Satan, a messenger from Satan, to afflict him with some bodily, we don't know exactly what it was, and people speculate all the time, but the Bible doesn't say, he doesn't say, but it was a, a debilitating physical thing. It was very painful, the way his language is he, to describe it. That's just to keep him humble. That's a good thing. So, you know, some of us might be being disciplined by God in the sense that he's trying to keep us humble. We're in fellowship with God. We keep short accounts with God. We're not out of fellowship with him for any length of time. We, when we sin, we confess it. We're obeying. We're going to Bible class. We're serving, giving, and we're praying. We're doing everything we're supposed to do. And, but yet, you might have such insight. God might be saying, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this, they're going to get, they're going to get arrogant if I don't give them a little pain here. I, I know it's best for them, so I want to keep them humble. Otherwise, if I don't, they're going to start thinking more of themselves than they ought to think. <laughs> so, okay, so that's a good thing because you don't want to be in a place where you're arrogant. You want to be in a place where you're humble. And that's very important. It's very hard for us sinners to be humble. Well, don't worry. God will keep us humble. If, if, if that's a promise. So let's look at some of these. Let's look at these passages. Look, uh, go over to Leviticus chapter 26. We have enough time to do it. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter, remember you have the first five books of the Bible, you know, Genesis, right? Exodus, Leviticus. Look at chapter 26. Look at verse 14. We'll start there. Leviticus chapter 26. Look at verse 14. If, however, you do not obey me and keep all these commandments, he's talking about the Mosaic law, which we studied in Exodus. God given the law on Mount Sinai, remember? If you reject my statutes and abhor my regulations, that means you don't obey them. That shows, that shows how you abhor him and reject him. So that you do not keep all my commandments and you break my covenant, the Mosaic covenant he's talking about, the law he gave to Moses. For I, for my part, will do this to you. I will inflict horror on you. Consumption and fever, which diminish eyesight and drain away the vitality of life. You will sow your seed in vain, because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you. You will be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you, and you will flee when there is no one pursuing you. This is true of Israel and in history. This is, this is that, you want to know, what was it, Queen Victoria? I can't remember what Queen of England it was. It wasn't that, it was like in the 1800s. And they asked her, why do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? Israel, she said. Because what God did to Israel, what he said he promised he would do in the word in, in the Old Testament, came to pass in history. And actually it's still coming to pass as we speak with regards to the Jews. Look at verse 18. If in spite of all these things you do not obey me, I will discipline you seven times more on account of your sins. Why would he discipline them seven more times than he would a pagan nation because they were his covenant people to whom they given greater revelation we studied in the, when we studied the remnant of Israel Romans 9 4 and 5 they were given the covenants the promises of the fathers the temple worship the Shekinah glory they had tremendous revelation to whom much is given much is required the discipline is going to be much more severe the punishment so he goes on he says in verse uh in verse 18, if in spite of all these things you do not obey me, I will discipline you seven times more on account of your sins. I will break your strong pride and make your sky like iron and your land like bronze. Uh, he hasn't done that in America, that's for sure. We get tons of rain out here in Iowa. <laughs> these guys are barely, they, they were really nervous about planting. I think they're starting to plant now. Your, verse 20, your strength will be used up in vain. Your land will not give its yield and the trees of the land will not produce their fruit. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. The remnant of Judah in Haggai's day knew exactly what Haggai was saying. He didn't quote chapter and verse in Leviticus, but they all knew what he was talking about. 
one of these passages is that one we just read. Look at Deuteronomy. Go to Deuteronomy. A couple of books after Leviticus. Look at Deuteronomy and let's look at chapter 11. Look at verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16. Make sure you do not turn away to serve and worship other gods. Of course, they did. The majority did. Then the anger of the Lord will erupt against you, and he will close up the sky so that it does not rain. The land will not yield its produce, and you will soon be removed from the good land that the Lord is about to give you. So there he has, he's saying, I'm going to discipline you. Look at, uh, look at verse uh, 13. Look at verse 13, the same chapter. Now, if you pay close attention to my commandments that I'm giving you today and love the Lord your God and serve him with all your mind and being, then he promises I will send rain for your land and its season, the autumn and the spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain, new wine and olive oil. I will provide pasture for your livestock and you will eat and you will, uh, you will eat your fill. So I say, I'm going to, I will bless you for your obedience. And then we saw the other verses. I will discipline you for your disobedience. Now, another passage, one more passage. Look at Deuteronomy 28. And let's see, I'm going to start you at verse 15, let's say. Let's do that, verse 15. Deuteronomy 28, 15. So I'm taking you these passages in, Old, in the Old Testament, in the law, because what we're reading about in Haggai, like verses chapter 1 in Haggai, verses 4, 5, and 6, and then 9 through 11, He's basically saying you're having agricultural hardship. And actually, I'm going to send a drought. Okay? Why? You didn't finish the tel- the rebuilding my house. You're putting your priorities, building your homes and taking care of your stuff ahead of me. Well, you know what? There's consequences for that kind of behavior. You don't, you're not showing you love me with your entire being and strength, so I'm going to discipline you. You're my covenant people. That's a responsibility. And you're in a covenant agreement with me, so this is what I want done. If you don't want to do it, well, guess what? This is why I'm, I'm hammering you right now, and you are having hardships. So which is what you want to do, okay? And all of that is back way back into the law, the Old Testament Mosaic Law. So Moses and the Mosaic Law, was those, the, that covenant served as the foundation, right, for the nation of Israel, not the church. Uh, church is on a different, uh, altogether, plan altogether. But the, the, the law was governed the Mosaic Law was governing the social, uh, political, uh, religious, economic life of the nation. Okay? And that's, the Mosaic Law was the only nation, Israel was the only nation that was given that. Not the United States or any other nation. It was Israel. That, the law was supposed to govern their nation. Okay? Now we can learn some, now we took some principles and put it in our own constitution, the Bill of Rights. A lot of principles of biblical principles in our constitution, Bill of Rights. No, no doubt about that. But they didn't say, okay, we're under the law now. We're in the Mosaic Law. No, that's not, that would be misapplying the Bible. So again, Haggai is referring to the discipline that God said they, he'd give Israel, and this is Israel, when they disobeyed him. So look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. And look at verse 15. But if you ignore the Lord your God and not careful to keep all his commandments and statutes that I'm giving you today, then all these curses will come upon you in full force. You'll be cursed in the city and cursed in the field. Your basket and your mixing bowl will be cursed. Your children will be cursed, as well as the produce of your soil, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. You'll be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. Verse 20. Then the Lord will send on you a curse, confusing you and opposing you and everything you undertake until you are destroyed and quickly perish because of the evil of your deeds and that you have forsaken me. Now, we'll go back to Haggai chapter 1. Now, listen to me. That has happened in history to Israel. Has it not? Absolutely. All of these things that God promised he would do to Israel if they disobeyed him has happened in history. And it's still, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to find its fruition during the tribulation period. And, but there'll be 144,000 Jews that'll become born again and saved. And then at the second advent of Christ, the end, 70th week of Daniel, the nation will repent and trust in their God, Jesus Christ, and they will have a national regeneration. 
So that they're in the times of the times of the Gentiles we're in now, which started with Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon conquering uh, Judah, is still going on. Jesus referenced it in Matthew, uh, Luke 24, 21. These are the times of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles will be the superpowers. But in the millennial kingdom, Israel will be the king. Israel will be the nation above all nations because her king, Jesus Christ, the king of the Jews, will be ruling over all the earth, not just Israel, but all the Gentile nations, okay, with his bride, the church. Now, look at Haggai. Now, I just want some final thoughts here. And we'll close. So it says in Haggai chapter 1, verse 6, You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but are never filled. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but are not warm. Those who earn wages uh, end up with holes in their money bags. Now, look, he says, verse 7, Moreover, the Lord who rules over says, who, who rules over all says, Pay close attention to these things also. That parallels, what he said there in verse 7, is paralleling verse 8. Think carefully about what you're doing. So in each instance, look at, he's saying, look at your life. Look at the hardships you're having. Look at the economic, agricultural hardships. It's all because of you. You brought it on yourselves. You are in a relationship with me, and you brought it on yourselves. Now, what are you going to do? Well, they did the most amazing thing. <laughs> they obeyed. I say amazing because usually the Israel didn't listen to the prophets. They killed them. We read, and we read starting in verse 8, that they obeyed. Uh, excuse me, uh, in verses 12 to 15, it says that they obeyed the message. And they, that means they repented. So they were on the way to getting blessed by God. In fact, he tells them at the end of, uh, look at chapter um, 12, chapter 1, verse 12, excuse me. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, after hearing this first message, and the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, along with the whole remnant of the people, obeyed the Lord their God. They responded favorably to the message of the prophet Haggai, who spoke just as the Lord, their God, instructed him. And the people began to respect the Lord. Now stop there. Haggai said exactly what God wanted him to say. Now what he had to say to them confronted them about and didn't speak well of them. That's the message of a man of God, whether the prophets of Israel or Jesus and the apostles or the pastors today. Sometimes God tells you to say things that you know they're not going to want to hear the people in your audience. So what do you do? You can be like Jonah, run away, you know, duck behind the pulpit or not show up or just be like most guys, be a creep buff and just tell people ever what they want to say. Haggai didn't do that. Haggai was right to the point. This is you, you're guilty here. This is why, ba 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 ba. And he told him like it was. And they listened to him. That is very unusual. Usually you don't see people, majority will, will, will throw, like they did to Moses, take up stones to stone them. Okay, that's what the prophets of Israel killed. And it was, you know, the, the, and it was God's people. <laughs> so he says in verse 13, uh, actually, look at verse 12, after, in verse 12, the second statement, they responded favorably to the message of the prophet Haggai, who spoke just to the Lord, their God had instructed him. And the people began to respect the Lord. Now look what it says. Now we have a flip-flop. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, Spoke the Lord's word to the people. I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord energized and encouraged the rubble, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, and the whole remnant of the people. They came and they worked on the temple of their God. The Lord rules over all. Now look at the end of the book. Hurry. Verse 14. Verses 14 and 19 actually parallel those verses we just read in verses 4 through 11 in chapter 1 because of the chaotic structure. Verse 14, then Haggai responded, the people of this nation are unclean in my sight, says the Lord. This prior to them obeying the command of rebuild the temple. And so is all their effort. Everything they offer is also unclean. Now therefore, reflect carefully on the recent past before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. From that time, when one came expecting a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. Why? Because God was disciplining them. When one came to the wine vat to draw out 50 measures from it, there were only 20. I struck all the products of your labor with blight, disease, and hail, and yet you brought nothing to me, says the Lord. Think carefully about the past. It's like he did in chapter 1. From today, the 24th day of the ninth month, to the day work on the temple was resumed, think about it. The seed is still in the storehouse, isn't it? 
and the vine, fig tree, pomegranate, and olive tree have not produced. Nevertheless, from today on, I will bless you. Why? Because they listened to him and obeyed him. So, when we, you know, when, you know, a lot of times when we think, okay, I, so if I obey God, God's going to bless me materially. He might, but he might not. We're not in the Mosaic law. You know, that's very important you understand that because some people get really discouraged and, and flip, take off on God because I'm not getting, I'm, I'm, why am I suffering economic hardship? Why, I'm, I'm obeying God. I'm supposed to get blessed, aren't I? That's what it says in the law. Yeah, that's right. That's what it says in the law. That's how Israel was dealt with. But you know what? When God, for us, you might get blessed materially, but he is really what the, church, the spiritual aspect application for the church age believer. When you obey God, you will be blessed. It might be materially, but what's more important, the spiritual, a more intimate fellowship with God and more of the character of Christ or getting more money? I mean, we all need money and stuff, right? But it's our intimate, be rich toward God, right? Jesus said, that's where it's at. Because people who make a lot of money, they go to die and their money can't save them. People who are loaded, they have cancer. They can't buy the doctors. They can't, get, they can't buy a cure. That Now what? They die and then what good is their money and their homes and everything? It's all... It did nothing for them. They lived their lives in vain. Don't be like that. You should thank God every day that you have a relationship and a fellowship with God. And things might be tough. Your health must be t- might be tough. And your, uh, you might, your, uh, your, your financial situation may be rough. But thank God that you are in fellowship with God and you're being blessed with a more intimate fellowship with God. Communing with God is the most important thing and the most greatest blessing you could ever have as a believer. Very, very important. We understand that. Well, been a great audience, and again, uh, we'll pick this up. Well, uh, we, this is our last weekday class until um, until uh, June. What is it? June uh, uh, June eleventh. So, uh, but Sunday we have class, so we'll be doing First Thessalonians, going into chapter three. So let's close in prayer, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this time to study Your Word. We pray that this message will be a great blessing to Your people in Jesus' name. Amen.